All right, mic test, mic test. Yes. Okay. You have permission to record me, provided you edit all unnecessary comments, especially when I'm tearing into people who come in to mock and blaspheme. I pray by the power of the Lord Jesus Christ, in His sovereign, glorious name, He enables me to speak truth without error, protecting me from stammering, from confusion, granting me clarity of thought and speech, and purifying my motives in His precious holy blood to do it for His glory, honor, and praise, and to bless you, His people, for His sake, in Jesus' name. Lord Jesus, protect us from the evil one, and please protect our families. Protect my wife and daughters. I beg you, please preserve them. In your grace and mercy and love, in Jesus' name we pray. Okay. To answer your question, it's it's thoroughly subjective. Post some Quranic verses for me, if you don't mind, because it's easier if someone posts verses for me, because if I copy and paste, it takes too much time. If you don't mind answering Judaism, post Surah 2, 23 to 24. There, the Quran already tells Muslims what their response should be. So they've already been conditioned on how to respond to any challenges to the Quran's uniqueness. Surah 2, 23 to 24 tells you, they cannot be objective. They cannot be objective. Because if they if they are to be objective and admit there's a surah comparable or even better than the Quran, then they're no longer Muslims. They leave the fold of Islam, and that can cost them their lives. <clears throat> and here the Quran tells you, Surah 2, 23-24. Now remember, put yourself in the shoes of a Mohammedan answering Judaism. Put yourself in the shoes of a Muslim as you read these passages and ponder, could you be objective in determining whether a chapter is comparable to the Quran, if not superior to it, in light of Surah 2, 23 to 24, which I, I think you're going to post for us. Let's see. Okay, here you go. Surah 2, 23. Pay attention, answering Judaism to what it says. And if you are in doubt about what we have sent down upon our servant Muhammad, then produce a surah the like thereof, and call upon your witnesses other than law if you should be truthful. Now notice verse 24, though. It's already rigged. The Quran rigs it. Because notice what it says in 24. It's already rigged, my friend. We'll just wait for my friend. But if you do not, and you will never be able to. See? You see how it's rigged? If you're a Muslim answering Judaism, and you read verse 24, and you were told that they'll never be able to, can you even admit that the challenge has been met, then fear the fire whose fuel is men and stones prepared for the disbelievers. Can you, as a Muslim, honestly, honestly, <clears throat> here we go with the ads again, anywhere you use sugar. test and see whether a chapter produced by an infidel, an unbeliever, resembles the Quran, if not surpasses it, in light of Surah 224. And you will never be able to so as a Muslim, can you say no? It's been done? Hong Kong Stock Exchange you, operator you with me there, answering Judaism? Can you, if you're a Muslim, accept the possibility that the Quran can be matched in its eloquence or in its literary structure? In light of Surah 224, when you're told what the response must be if you're a Muslim. Your response must be if you're a Muslim, they'll never be able to. So can they be objective? Can they even be honest? And assessing whether the challenge has been met. Can they honestly assess it? Honestly? You got it. So that Quran, that passage right there tells you it's thoroughly subjective, purely subjective. Because no Muslim in his, in his right mind, in her right mind, can accept the possibility of the Quran being challenged, having the Quran challenge met, when the response given to them by the Quran is... The infidels, the unbelievers, can never do it. That's the first problem. Do you see it? Is that clear as day? That's the first problem. There's a second problem, my friend. Second problem. Surah 1788. Let me show you what it says. Surah 1788. Let's look at what it says. Because you're going to see a second problem with the Quran's claim. Surah 1788. Because according to our earliest and most reliable Muslim sources, the Quran challenge was met, and it was met by a jinn. Surah 1788 says this, Say, verily, though mankind and the jinn, not just mankind, and the jinn should assemble to produce the like of this Quran, they could not produce the like thereof, though they were helpers one of another. So if jinn and men combined, they could not produce something like the Quran. 
But remember what the Quran says about Satan, Iblis. Satan, whose Arabic name is Iblis. His name in the Quran is Iblis. Remember what it says about him. Surah 1850. And remember when we said to the angels, fall prostrate before Adam, and they fell prostrate, all save Iblis, he was of the jinn. Notice, Iblis, the Arabic name for Satan, was of the jinn. According to the most earliest and reliable Islamic sources, Satan inspired Muhammad to recite verses that he thought were Quran. And the people who heard those verses thought they were Quran. That means, according to Islam's earliest sources, Satan was able to mimic the Quran and match it to the extent that Muhammad thought he was reciting Quranic verses and the people hearing him thought they were Quranic verses when in reality they were verses inspired by Satan. Are you with me there? Answering Judaism? So the challenge has been met according to the Muslim sources and it was met by a jinn named Satan. Now let's see what the two Jalal say about the satanic verses. Hold on. Now we have extensive documentation on the website, right? Answeringislam.net. And David Wood has done a thorough debate on the satanic verses, right? Their historical veracity. So if you want the documentation, go to the website or watch David Wood's debate with Adan Rashid on the satanic verses, and you'll see. <clears throat> that the earliest, most reliable Muslim sources affirm to a T that Muhammad recited verses given to him by Satan, and Muhammad did not know they came from Satan. He thought they were revelations of Allah. And the people hearing him thought they were Quranic revelations. So Satan has met the challenge. Satan has met the challenge of the Quran. Now let me see what Tafsir says here. Here you go. Tafsir al Jalalain, which you can read online for free in English. The Tafsir of the two Jalals. Here's the link. Tafsir al Jalalain. Notice what it says about the satanic verses. The verses that Satan inspired Muhammad to recite, unbeknownst to him. Let's read it. You guys ready? Let's read it. It's lengthy. This comes from their commentary on Surah 2252. Surah 2252. Let's read. And we did not send before you any messenger, this is a prophet who has been commanded to deliver a message, or prophet, one who has not been commanded to deliver anything, but that when he recited the scripture, Satan cast into his recitation what is not from the Quran, but which those to whom he, the prophet, had been sent would find pleasing. The prophet had, during an assembly of the men of Quraysh, after reciting the following verses from Surat al-Najm, have you considered Lat and Uzza and Manat, the third one? The chapter 53, verses 19 and 20 of the Quran. Added, as a result of Satan, casting them unto his tongue, without his, the prophets, being aware of it. He added these words, as a result of Satan putting these words on his tongue, and Mama didn't know, the following words. Those are the high-flying cranes, Al-Kharaniq, Al-Ula, Kharaniq, Al-Ula, and in Indeed, their intercession is to be hoped for. Muhammad to praise the goddesses of the Meccans. Banat Allah, the daughters of Allah. Right? <clears throat> and so they, the men of Quraysh, were thereby delighted. Gabriel, however, later informed him, the prophet, of this that Satan had cast unto his tongue, and he was grieved by it. Muhammad is grieved that he recited verses from Satan. But was subsequently comforted with this following verse that he might be reassured of God's pleasure. Thereat, God abrogates, nullifies whatever Satan has cast, then God confirms his revelations. And God is knower of Satan's casting of that which has been mentioned, wise, and is enabling him, Satan, to do such things, for he, do, he does whatever he will. Did you catch it? Answering Judaism? Muhammad recited verses from Satan, a jinn, verses that he thought were Quran. That means Satan's recitation resembled the Quran perfectly to the extent that Muhammad could not tell the difference between verses from Satan and verses from his Lord. So that means Islam's most reliable, earliest sources confirm the challenge of the Quran was met by Satan himself. 
So much for the challenge of the Quran. Did you catch that answering Judaism? Finally, the Quran says, not only is the Quran unmatchable, so is the Torah of Moses. The Torah of Moses is also unmatchable. Here, let me prove it to you. Surah 28, 48 to 49. Surah 28, 48 to 29. Here, Surah 28, 48 to 29. I'll give you two versions of the translation. This is from Pictal. Pictal's version of the Quran. Surah 28, 48 to 49. Now, let me give you another version. <laughs> Halali Khan, the Saudi Arabian, Saudi Arabian version. Surah 28, 48 to 49. The Quran says that the Torah itself is unmatchable. There you go. The first one was from Pictal. This is from Halali Khan. Okay, let's read. Let's read both versions, starting with Pictal. Okay. But when there came unto them the truth from our presence, from our face, they said, why is he not given the like of what was given unto Moses? Notice number one. Muhammad's contemporaries saw that Muhammad could not produce any miracles like Moses did. Why has not been given to Muhammad what was given to Moses before him? Reason? Because he's a false prophet. Which is why he couldn't do the miracles that Moses did. Now notice the response, the lame response given why Muhammad could not do miracles like Moses. Did they not disbelieve in that which was given unto Moses of old? They said two magics that support each other. Two magics that support each other. Here, Muhammad's contemporaries are sa uh, saying that Muhammad's Quran and Moses' Torah confirm each other. Now, the only way Moses' Torah could be confirmed by the Quran at the time of Muhammad is if Moses' Torah was still available at the time of Muhammad. Otherwise, their response makes no sense. Right? And they say, lo, in both we are disbelievers. We believe in th disbelieve in both of them. The Torah and the Quran. Now watch. Say unto them, O Muhammad, then bring a scripture from the presence of Allah that giveth clearer guidance than these two, that I may follow it if you are truthful. Did you catch it? The challenge is not just the Quran can't be matched, neither the Torah can be matched, and Muhammad is challenging his contemporaries to produce a scripture with clearer guidance than either the Torah or the Quran. Now watch how Hilali Khan translates his verse. But when the truth, i.e. Muhammad, with his message has come to them from us, they say, why is he not given the like of what was given to Musa? They did, not, did they not disbelieve in that which was given to Musa of old? They say, two kinds of magic, the Torah and the Quran, each helping the other. And they say, verily, in both we are disbelievers. Say to them, O Muhammad, then bring a book from Allah, which is a better guide than these two, the Torah and the Quran, that I may follow it if you are truthful. Did you catch it? The Torah is on the same level of the Quran, according to the Quran. Both of them cannot be matched in terms of their guidance. But here's my, my dilemma. If the Torah of the Jews at Muhammad's time had been corrupted, what kind of guidance could a corrupted book contain? What kind of guidance could a corrupted book give to people? You see the problem answering Judaism? You got it. But this further proves that Muhammad, contrary to what Muhammadans will tell you today, did not think for a moment that the scriptures of the Jews and Christians, which he had access to at that time, were corrupted. He was fully convinced they were the incorruptible, preserved words of Allah. Hopefully that answered your question. I'll relinquish the mic. If anyone has a question, take the mic. If not, I have to take a short break. And Lord willing, we'll begin teaching.